This is Emily Hall with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSC Library. Today is Friday, July 13th, 2018, and I'm interviewing John Andrews for the Deep Roots Oklahoma Authors Oral History Project. John, your first book of poetry, Colin is Changing His Name, was a finalist for the 2018 Oklahoma Book Awards. You're working on your PhD in English and Creative Writing at OSU, and you're newly married to your husband, Randy. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you for having me. Where were you born and where did you grow up? So I was born in Roseville, California, which is just, it's like a suburb, I guess, of Sacramento, California. Um, and then from there, I, I was born in California, but I don't consider it home because we moved to Arkansas when I was about four or five. Mm -hmm. So like the bits and pieces, memories that I have of it were just like, you know, a playground and a beach and... Um, so it wasn't super home to me, but I grew up in, in Sheridan, Arkansas, which is just south of Little Rock um, in the timber capital area of Arkansas. We actually have Timber Fest there. Oh, really? Which is, yeah, it's, it's um, the biggest festival for timber, and they have the uh, U.S. Lumberjack Com uh, championships there so if you ever like turn on ESPN in the fall and you see it that's oh. in my hometown okay. but it's, it's a tiny town it's tiny mm -hmm. but yeah we have lots of pine trees yeah people <laughs> live there I think last time I drove through it was 3,050 something yeah it's small it's small so what did you like to do for fun there where were favorite places to go hang out activities so I actually, when I was, when we first were in Arkansas, mm -hmm. uh, my mother loves horses. And the, part of the reason we moved there was my dad's job, but also so my mother could raise and show horses. Mm -hmm. And so growing up, I actually um, used to show horses in Boys Western Pleasure. Oh. I'm trained in <laughs> Western Pleasure riding, which is like not the super fast barrels, but mm -hmm. the slow, like pretty Western um, oh, style writing. And I actually went to the state competition. I was 16th in the really? state. So wow. that was when I was younger, younger. And then probably about when I was 14, when I got in the high, moved closer to high school and I was in band, then I became like the biggest marching band nerd and stopped mm -hmm. doing horse shows. Um, but I still love uh, horses. Yeah. Do you um, ride still or find opportunities to? I haven't in a couple of years, but my father-in-law just retired and he, they live in, my husband's family lives in Oklahoma and they're just in Sand Springs and they have two horses that they oh. want to start going on trail rides again now that he's retired and mm -hmm. has the time to do so. So I'm going to go get my saddle from home and get to yeah. go riding again soon. Yeah. Well, that sounds That's like exciting. fun. So tell me more about your um, parents. What's your mother's name and tell me more about what she does and what she's like and your personality mm -hmm. so my mother um sue susan andrews uh, susan westfig is her like, real last or her maiden name um, and she so when we were growing up she was a stay-at-home mom mm -hmm. uh, but she has her bachelor's in animal science which did not make sense to anyone else in arkansas at first mm -hmm. when we were growing up they're like well, what does that mean um but basically she works for the fda now in um, where is it? It's in is it? It's Jefferson NCTR National Center for Toxicological Research, <laughs> um, in, in near Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Um, she works specifically with um, I forget. I think it's chicken eggs. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's what she does. Mm -hmm. I know she runs tests on them, and that's about. It, um, yeah. it's, I'm, it's way more fancy than that, mm -hmm. but she, she said she's like a chemist, physical chemist or something. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to try to understand. I know she like can tell us when the chicken eggs are bad, so. Okay. That's <laughs> important. <laughs> yeah. So she does that now. Yeah. Um, but for a while, like her first job when we were living in Arkansas, like when my sisters were old enough and she was home, well, she got into teaching so she was a high school biology teacher for mm -hmm. for two years and then she worked um, for another lab like the fda but it was a private one and then now she works for the fda how would you describe her personality oh gosh she's just like one of the strongest people i've ever met like mm -hmm. 
she um, and she's very very smart, yeah. but she doesn't like let it get in the way. One of my earliest memories of her, when we first moved to Arkansas, she got Lyme disease oh, and no. pneumonia. Oh, goodness! Like, and my sister was my baby sister, baby baby sister, was two, and she's home with the three kids, and it's winter, and my dad's at work. And for some reason, she's still trying to entertain us and still trying to like pretend like she's not sick, which is her MO. Like she would never let anyone know she was ill. She's out in the backyard trying to put up a tire swing in the winter. And she's got Lyme disease and pneumonia. Wow. My dad was so furious. He got home. He's like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> so she's just like, she's so strong. She doesn't ever... Like you, she doesn't let anyone know she's in pain. Like mm -hmm. she's the kind of person who just treks on and like always is just so resilient. Yeah. Tell about your dad. So my dad, he is an aerospace engineer um, for Lockheed, you know, Aerojet Rocketdyne. Um, that's the reason we moved to Arkansas in mm -hmm. the first place because he was working at um, like this company that's now out of business because Roar, they built jet engines, I believe. He's an engineer for them, um, and they had a place in Arkansas. We were living in Chula Vista, mm -hmm. San Diego at the time, and it was not a nice place to be. Yeah. And my parents were like, we could sell our house and like have way more living in Arkansas, and they were going to pay for everything to move us there. So I'm like, they were like, let's go. And we go from a tiny little house in the middle of Chula Vista to living in like a nine acres of pine for us mm -hmm. and so they thought that was a great idea so we did that um, and then Roar went under and he now worked he worked a lot of different aerospace companies and then at one point he worked for a trailer hitch company which was kind of interesting like mm -hmm. my mom always jokes that that's like a big step down like going from jet engines to trailer pulls <laughs> but then he went back to Aerojet um, and now he works for Aerojet Rocket. Oh, no, no, I keep saying that. That was one of the ones. Currently works for, yeah, no, Aerojet. Aerojet. Okay. But he's worked for Boeing. He's worked for um, Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. Mm -hmm. If there's an aerospace company, he's worked for. Yeah. What was his name? <laughs> uh, Bob Andrews. Bob. Or Robert. Robert okay. Keith Andrews Jr. So you mentioned you have sisters. <clears throat> um, how many siblings do you have, and where do you fall in the lineup? So I'm the oldest of three. Okay. Um, I have two younger sisters. I have Catherine, or Katie, is the middle. Um, and she still lives in, she's like 20, oh God, I'm bad at their ages. Oh, okay. She's two years younger than me, so she's 28. That's how it is. And then my sister, Jessie, is three years younger than that. So she's like 23 or four. Ooh. I'll tell them not to watch this. They'll just judge me. <laughs> yeah, we can. We can. Uh, we can just add a yeah. note in the in the transcript. <clears throat> no big deal. Figured out there. I'm bad at ages. Um, but she, my sister Katie, lives in Little Rock still, or lives in Little Rock, mm -hmm. not still. It's near Sheridan, and she works for Arvest Bank, which mm -hmm. is a regional bank. Um, I don't know exactly what she does. I just know yeah. she works for the bank. She went to Arkansas Tech for her bachelor's. She's very, she's my sister who's like a lot smarter than me. My parents always said like, oh, Katie's the smart one. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they're always like, your sister is more talented than you, um, but she just doesn't try as hard. <laughs> so that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I don't believe they believe that. I think they were just trying to push me. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> three kids. Are... Oh, yeah. It's a lot of dynamics parents can <laughs> use to get their kids to do stuff. Exactly. That's good for them. But she's a super talented artist, though. Like, oh, she, she can always, like, she can draw so well. When we were little, I'd always make her draw stuff for me. Because mm -hmm. she was the way more talented artist. I don't, I don't ever feign trying to be good at drawing or painting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not happening. How about Jessie? What did she like to do? She, um, so she actually is in Oklahoma now. She goes to the University of Central Oklahoma in Edmond. Mm -hmm. um, she's working on her master's in higher ed, and she wants to go on too. So she was the she's kind of like the odd one out of the family, because like Katie and I do more artistic things, um, but then Jessie's more of the like she was the, the one who was in a sorority mm -hmm. <laughs> in her 
undergrad and now she wants to work with like student activities so she's the more like outgoing and and um like the I don't know how to like kind of cheerleader type person she wasn't ever a cheerleader mm -hmm. but she's like the you know yeah, bring people together and, and, yeah yeah so she loves that so she's she's sweet it's been wonderful because we didn't hang out that much when I was little we were little because we had the bigger gap mm -hmm. in age and now that she's been living here for the past year and a half we've actually got to hang out and, and like yeah become friends as adults mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> which has been nice wonderful to have that kind of opportunity mm -hmm. here um, how about your grandparents? Or did you know them? Were you close mm -hmm. to them? So my mom's parents, I didn't really know. They they both passed. Well, my grandmother passed away when I was one or two. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure when that happened. Um, so I didn't really know her. I know stories, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't really know her. And then my grandfather, uh, um, these are my mother's parents. I didn't. I, he lived in California, and then he went to a retirement home in Iowa, where my aunt, two of my aunts live in Iowa City. Um, and I, he, by the time that I was old enough to be able to remember him, he had extreme dementia. Oh, okay. Um, he worked. He also worked in aerospace, and he worked on the SR seventy one Blackbird and the stealth bomber. So he had a lot of things that like, he was not at liberty to say, and like a lot of my family didn't even know what he did. He was sworn to secrecy, and it was kind of like he always just said he was an engineer. And so my mom, till she was like in college, or not college, I think she was in high school when she finally figured it out. But she just told people he was an engineer, then he worked on trains. <laughs> <laughs> and that was okay. not the case whatsoever. He, yeah. But when he was older with dementia, he, like, he was convinced that um, the Russian KGB was after him and like, my mom said he had like freakouts in the nursing home, like he couldn't be around anyone who like had a Russian accent or things like that. Um, so he did some some crazy things. There's this book we have actually over our, in our house a picture of the actual SR seventy one Blackbird's first flight, and it's signed by all the original engineers, and his name is among them. So that's oh. really super cool. Yeah. Um, oh, what the, was his name? A uh, Roger Westfig. How do you spell that? West what? and with and then Vig, like just Fig, but with a V. Okay. Which is funny because when they, I've been doing some genealogical research mm -hmm. to figure that out. And when they immigrated to America, they their name they couldn't under be understood Ellis Island, mm -hmm. and it's actually West Vic, V I C K. Oh. But they wrote it as a G at customs because they were just like you know lazy and couldn't understand. These yeah. Nordic people. Mm -hmm. So, so what do you know about uh, <laughs> about uh, their background through your research with genealogy? So I know that. Um, so that's my grandfather. I'm no more. My aunt or my grandma is harder to figure out because her um, father was adopted, and so mm -hmm. like the paperwork, we have no idea. It's like yeah. no idea where he came from. He always said that he was part Native American, but that like. There's nothing to prove any of that. Yeah. And he, it begins at an adoption place, like in an orphanage. So we don't really know where he came from. But my grandfather, the West Vig side, like we can trace them all the way back to Norway. Mm -hmm. um, his grandfather, his father, his grandfather was the one who immigrated to the U.S. And they moved to, no surprise, Michigan, mm -hmm. and then moved to Wisconsin, like, you know, staying up in a, traditionally Nordic part of America. Right. Um, and they had, so that would be my great, great, the first guy had six kids, and his grandfather, um, Clifford, was one of the kids. And that's, yeah, that's, that's a, I know where they came from, and that's about it. Yeah, your father's <laughs> side? So my father's side is really muddled. Mm -hmm. um, my so my Andrew my grandfather Robert Andrew he's also Robert Andrews and Sharon so I can t my grandmother's side is easy he's mm -hmm. how and her family comes from Ireland easy we can trace that straight back um, I think his grandfather my grandfather's father no my great grandfather's father so great great grandfather was from Ireland. 
So that one's a pretty country. My grandfather, though, it gets, it gets really complicated because um, his mother, Mamie Shaw, is the daughter of Del- Del- yeah, Dolores Artelian. Mm-hmm. And so we can trace her back to Mexico. And we can trace um, her father from North Dakota. And then it gets fuzzy. So we, I don't, we're still trying to figure all that out. But great, great, great grandma is from Mexico, and great, great, great grandfather's from yeah. Yeah. They all did the the so West it's Coast. Kind of interesting to mm-hmm. to know about that. My great grandmother, his my grandfather's mother was a. Uh, there's pictures of her playing the bass guitar in a mariachi band at the opening of some road in the in California. Oh, <laughs> and oh. it's so funny to see the pictures. She's a tiny woman carrying this like big old yeah guitar. Yeah, so you've got some so. uh, musical talent. Yeah, family then. <laughs> yeah, which doesn't make sense because my grandfather did not have the musical talent. Mm-hmm. So, what were you like as a child? Um, I want to say that I was a happy child. <laughs> I think I was nice. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you like music? I did like music. Mm-hmm. I was in band. What um, did you play? I played clarinet mm-hmm. and then bass clarinet. And then in marching band, I was I thought the clar- there was no point to play the clarinet in marching band for me because you can't really hear a woodwind instrument outside. So I marched cymbals in college. Oh. So that was fun. And I was drum major in high school, so conducting. Okay, so you continued all the way yeah. to college. Yeah, that. that was how I partially paid for my undergrad. Do you play anything now for fun? So I still own my bass clarinet, and I've played in the Stillwater Community Band every now and then. Oh. Um, just it depends on like when the schedule works out. Yeah. Because like I, I've been teaching night classes, and a lot of their schedule is like, oh, it's my classes in the middle yeah, of. Yeah, kind of conflicts with yeah. that. So do you have a particular teacher when you were younger who? kind of stands out or who maybe kind of encouraged your writing or your love of music? So I think the the first teacher that really like made me think of writing as an actual something you could do as an art mm-hmm. form was in junior high, I don't know, high school. Um, there's this camp that I used to work for every summer for the past four summers called Arkansas Governor's School. Mm-hmm. And my teacher there, Sandy Longhorn, she's a poet. She's fabulous. She was the first teacher who like showed us, hey, this is what like poetry can be. Um, it's not, you know, she actually encouraged the art of it, whereas everything before that, it was just like, here's a form, write this limerick, write this haiku, and like, I was like eh, it's kind of boring. Like I wrote in a journal and like would have scraps and doodles of things, but I never took it seriously until her influence is like, look at all these books of poetry. Like, look at, it's a still a living thing. Yeah. It's actually alive and happening. And didn't get that in the regular public education. Mm-hmm. So she definitely stands out. And then there's a, she gave me a blurb for my, on the back yeah. of the first book. So wow. I consider her like my first major mentor. <laughs> Cause I, I emailed her way after. I was like, hey, by the way, I have a book. It's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing this, and so she's she's been super wonderful and super supportive since mm-hmm. then. What's your earliest memory of writing something creative? Did you always keep a journal <clears throat> and were writing like as a kid and keep that up? Or? I mean, I journaled um, not religiously. Mm-hmm. Um, I did it a lot though, off and on. The first thing I remember writing though, I was like six years old. I tried to write these little comics. And I thought mm-hmm. I was good at drawing, and then, then I made my sister draw some of them <laughs> for me. Um, but I liked storytelling in that medium of just like the short comic books. I remember asking for a stapler when I was six or seven. I asked for a stapler for my birthday so I could like make my own fake little mini oh, yeah. <laughs> comic books. And my mom thought, I'm pretty sure she thought I was really weird for just wanting a stapler, <laughs> like instead of like Hot Wheels or, or whatever. Yeah, that, that's the earliest thing, but it's like, you know, not serious. Um, mm-hmm. But I've journaled off and on for ever. I still have them all, and it's like fun to go back and look at them. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this quote by Joan Didion. I, I think it was Joan Didion. 
what she said, like the point of like journaling isn't to, to like make anything that anyone else is going to see. It's just to remember how I felt to be me in that moment. Yeah. And so really it's like fun. fun to go look back at like, how did it feel to be who I was at that time? Yeah. And so it's been, I often turn to that for writing. It's kind of like a time, time capsule. Mm-hmm. Could you tell me about a book or books that were important to you in your early life? So in, in, um, in the sense of poetry or in the sense of... Either one. So I really loved Ray Bradbury's stories. Mm-hmm. Like my mom would read, my grandfather, uh, Westvig grandfather, really loved Ray Bradbury. And my mother had a book of short stories of his and she would read them to us. And so they were just... That was one of my favorites because I just love the sci-fi-ness of it. Um, even though Ray Bradbury is still very grounded in reality, but it's like not, I wouldn't call it magical realism because it, it's, it could be science. Like a lot of it could just be the future with scientific things. Um, I just love that kind of imagination and, and the weirdness of it. Like Dandelion Wine, uh, such a good, good book of his, yeah. especially for summer and being a kid in the middle of, Arkansas with nothing to do mm-hmm. <laughs> for two months. Definitely. Did you read uh, poetry when you were younger, like before mm-hmm. um, Sandy was your teacher? So I, I not really, no. Yeah. Um, I didn't come to poetry till like her. And then I remember like the poets mm-hmm. that she gave us and thinking that I, I mean, of course I read poetry in school, but I didn't, it wasn't exciting to yeah. me. I mean, with Walt Whitman's great, and I appreciate him now. Mm-hmm. But at the time, I was just like, oh, okay, this is boring. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened with your writing and education after high school? You mentioned you had a scholarship. So I went, I wanted, I wanted to be like all the, like all the other smart kids. who were like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of Arkansas. Mm-hmm. I hate this place. Um, and I remember at governor school they kept saying over and over if you stay you know you get all these perks and at the time in Arkansas they had this wonderful scholarship system where if you made just like the certain GPA and certain thing um, you would get at least tuition and fees covered at a university so it's just like huh like why wouldn't you just take the free college degree so I fell in love with the University of Central Arkansas just because it like the one, they gave me money. Two, they were just a really wonderful school. They had a great music program, mm-hmm. probably better than U of A. Sorry, U of A. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and they just had a great writing community. Mm-hmm. They had a really cool literary magazine that, at the time, they like U of A is great for your masters in creative writing. But they didn't, when I was touring it, they didn't really have much for undergrads. And so, yeah. I was like, I like UCA. So I chose to go there because, hey, they're like, here's this scholarship covering your tuition and fees. And so um, marching band that I tried out for band and they gave me a scholarship for all four years to cover the room and board. Mm -hmm. So between the two, I was able to get a free college degree. And I'm like, if I go out of state, I looked at, you know, dream schools and things in better, better places. Um, And, you know, you'd end up paying crazy amounts of money. And I was like, Mm -hmm. Why, when this is a good place right here? So I chose to go to UCA, and I don't regret it at all. Yeah, you can find good mentors and, oh, yeah. you know, that intellectual mm-hmm. stimulation or challenges mm-hmm. there. For yeah, sure. exactly. So when did you start thinking of yourself as a writer or as a poet? Um, I probably I knew I wanted to do it seriously in college. Um, probably about when I was a junior, I knew I wanted, like, this is, I want to go get an MFA, I want to do creative writing, um, and started to think about it very seriously then. Um, but I wouldn't, I didn't really call myself a writer until, mm-hmm. until, like, I had publications. The Now I'll just say it in public, like, I even wrote it on my passport application, I'm a poet now, because I have this in my hand (laughs) like this is now I'm like fully comfortable I feel like it was like a slow like okay yes okay maybe I am okay Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know and now it's just like yes like I fill out my taxes and or my husband filled out the taxes yes Yes. that's the best reason to get married (laughs) not having to do taxes 
And I was like, he was like, what do you put for your job? I was like, poet, put poet on there. <laughs> Even though it doesn't pay the bills, but. <laughs> Still. So got now the, I definitely do. But. Got, got the book. So uh, where did you get your, where did you do your MFA? At Texas State in okay. San Marcos. Why did you want to get your um, PhD in English and creative writing? What does the PhD bring yeah. bring to things? So it's, it's, I mean, the MFA is terminal. Yeah. Is it considered a terminal degree? The PhD, though, um, I knew I wanted to go to the to OSU a long mm-hmm. time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of weird that I, I was going to apply for the MFA here, but then I decided, well, this is the school that OSU has the PhD and the MFA, and it's not, it doesn't look good to get, you know, both mm-hmm. at the same place. And I knew I wanted to do it, so I went ahead and didn't apply here for the master's because there's only, like, there's very few PhD creative writing programs in the U.S. Yeah. And I was use one of them and in the top 15 of them. So I was I, I knew I wanted to do it. Um, at the time that I did apply, though, here, I didn't want to, mm-hmm. which is weird. I just finished my I was just finishing my MFA and I planned to take like two or three years off and just like work and and live in Texas and live in Austin because, you know. Yeah. Austin's cool sometimes mm-hmm. and so but my parents were like what are you gonna like why don't you go ahead and apply and and I'd missed the deadlines for all the other PhDs except OSU so I was like uh-huh. I won't get it I didn't think I'd get in mm-hmm. I didn't think my portfolio was strong enough when I graduated I thought you know they're not gonna they're gonna say no and then they called me up after I applied, and I forgot I applied. You did. <laughs> I forgot I applied. And then I got the phone call and the email, and they're offering, like, here's this scholarship, here's this, like, please come. I was like, okay. And I had been offered a fellowship to live in, a, in a, the Smithville house in Texas. And so mm-hmm. I was, like, balancing the two, and my parents were like, just go ahead and go. And my professors were kind of like, one of them, she was saying, oh, it's going to be such a grindstone. Like, maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> Yeah. But everyone else was like, just do it, just do it. And then my ex at the time, now ex, who yeah. wasn't at the time, convinced me, let's go. Like, let, I'll move with you. It'll uh, be wonderful. Was it? Oh, no. No, no, no. Well, you, like, we picked out a house and, like, had a place to live and everything. And then I was moving up here. Like, I was coming to, no, I was coming up to, like, con- figure out everything and like put down the down payments and you know mm-hmm. everything and then I got the text message it's like I was on I-35 on my way here and I get a text message breakup it's like oh great so I had to go home and like pack my stuff and then move to Oklahoma oh, goodness. with Adam so that was miserable but I wasn't gonna do it and I'm glad that I did mm-hmm. anyway it was kind of like a whirlwind of crazy yeah <laughs> to come here but it, it worked out it worked out yeah. And um, who's your uh, advisor or your main Here? mentor? Yeah. Uh, Lisa Lewis. Okay. Yeah, Lisa Lewis is she's fantastic. She was part of the, she was the reason I came here. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, her I was going to ask if there was a certain person you wanted to study oh, yeah. with. Yeah, her work is, it was fantastic. And at the time, I knew that the other professor had just, they had just lost a professor and they were like switching out professors. And when I applied and asked, like, I was like, do I get to work with Lisa? And she's like, well, yeah, because I'm the only one <laughs> right now. And we're like switching people out. And so I was like, okay, perfect. I'm going. <laughs> yeah. So it was just meant, meant to be. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, your book, Colin is Changing His Name. Tell me what it was like putting this book together. So the book is, I put it all together when I'm in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started my first year here, okay. um, I put it together. It was all based on the idea, this the weirdness that is. Um, my husband's name is John, mm-hmm. John Randall Kitchens, and I'm John Robert Andrews. So it's like Jr. And then we're both have different, you know, AK. Mm-hmm. So um, I was thinking about the, and he goes by Randy. Thank the Lord. Yeah, like, that would get way too confusing. That would. But like, the idea came from. Um, like the fact that we're both with the same name and then it got me thinking about the way pronouns work and how confusing like he and him, like he loves him and just mm-hmm. how the weirdness, the strangeness of it, how the, the world and the language itself seems antithetical to yeah. this kind of existence. Like it doesn't want it to make sense. Yeah. 
-hmm. And so I started playing with the idea of like, well, what if everyone, like, what if Colin loves Colin? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like how confusing that gets and how crazy that gets. And then what if every gay person is named Colin? Like, how does that love triangle work, you know, like, or the, the, the messiness of like between yeah. blurring the lines between friend and lover and, mm -hmm. you know, that person over there, <laughs> the confusing. So the idea came from that. And then I just started playing with it. Like, I just started writing all these Colin poems and coming up with like ideas. Like a lot of the people in here, like a lot of the Collins in the book actually are people, but you'll mm -hmm. never know who they are because the wonderful trick of calling them Colin. Yeah. It's like, I have friends who will read and like, hey, you wrote about me. And I'm like, no, that's Colin. And they're like, but I'm Colin. And I'm like, are you Colin? Which one? Exactly. So it's like simultaneously like hides their identities too, because so much of like, you know, there are a lot of people who are not out and it's not safe mm -hmm. for them to be out mm -hmm. in Oklahoma or, you know, just in the world. Yeah. And so it simultaneously hides and reveals a lot about the person and reveals like the weirdness. So it's, it's, it was a really fun project. Yeah, and could you uh, put up the, the book oh, yeah. so we could kind of see the, the cover? Could you tell us a little bit about that? So I love the I love the cover. Um, yeah. It Claire's gonna kill me for this. Claire, my friend Claire has her ex boyfriend. Claire's in in the po the program with me. Mm -hmm. um, she's a good friend, but her boyfriend is an art professor. Her ex boyfriend now. That's why she's gonna kill me. Ex ex boyfriend professor at C. Uh, I'm not gonna say. So he's he's a professor somewhere. Yeah. He um did this series of phot these photographs at like a high speed, and so he basically just told people to undress as fast as possible, and so he snapped them so like the it gets that effect. Yeah. It's a fantastic series of just like all these um, people just like they're such cool movement and motion, mm -hmm. and it's like enacting literal change to me. Yeah. And I fell in love with him. And he actually submitted stuff to be used on a cover of the Cimarron Review. And I, mm -hmm. this was one of them. And I loved this cover so much. And we were in the meeting to decide, like, which one we were going to use for the cover of Cimarron. And I knew I wanted it. I was like, I want that for the cover of my book someday. And I didn't even have a book contract yet. Yeah. But I was like, I want that someday. So I hope they don't use it because they can't use it if they do. Yeah. And, and luckily, everyone at the table was like, oh, I don't like it. I don't like it. Oh, so like, wow. And then I was like, yeah, I hate it. It's awful. <laughs> that should not be the cover. Um, and so sure enough, then like later when I actually got the contract, I immediately was there like, do you have an idea for a cover? And yeah. they had broken up, Claire and, mm -hmm. and Brad, but I didn't have his contact information. I was like, hey, can I get a hold of your ex, please? <laughs> and then got in contact and yeah, he gave me works. this wonderful yeah, it's cover. Yeah, kind of the perfect image for yeah. what happens throughout the poems throughout um, mm -hmm. throughout the book. Um, so we were kind of talking about this before the interview started, and mm -hmm. I think maybe you kind of answered this question a little bit, but using Colin and um, like throughout throughout the poem, standing in for all these different mm -hmm. people or concepts or things. So what concepts or words do you think Colin stands in for? And what effect do you think it has on the residents of the poems? So for me, I think it stands in, I envision it as standing in not just for like myself or for yeah. my husband, but also for like, um, it, it can happen. There's instances where it happens is like the word faggot is replaced mm -hmm. with Colin, um, which hopefully gives the effect of like, oh, like that's messed up, but you're calling someone by their name, but it's offensive. Yeah. Or like, or stands in for gay, or stands in for um, any, really any gay person, or gay male mm -hmm. person. Um, I'm not going to like try to own. <laughs> like, yeah. I, that's another book. Yeah. That's another book. Um, but yeah, it just stands in for that. It's gotten funny because in, like if we're out, if Randy and I are out in town, we'll be like, oh, you think his name's Colin? <laughs> <laughs> like secretly to ourselves. And, How did you pick the name Colin? It's, so I had, a, a long time ago, I had a good friend um, who was named Colin. I've always just liked the name. So, like, it was like a middle school friend mm -hmm. who was named Colin. And I've always thought that was a cool name, one. And then two, it's just kind of awkward to say the name Colin. Like, it makes your mouth move in a way that's like mm. a little, sometimes uncomfortable to say. And 
then there's also like the weirdness of like calling Colin. Yeah. So it has that K sound that that plays off of so many other sounds mm-hmm. that makes simultaneously funny because K is the the funniest sound apparently in the according to humorists K mm-hmm. sounds. So like it makes something that's dark sound a little more funny. Yeah. At times and and the weirdness it brings out the weirdness of it like mm-hmm. Colin 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 Colin. Mhm. So. That's, I just fell in love with that name. Yeah. I have a friend though who's in the PhD program here, also named Colin. But he is—he's not—he's not a Colin, but he's named Colin. Yes. <laughs> and he loves to like—he'll tell people, "Oh yeah, it's about me," because we did it. We actually did our masters together, uh-huh. and then now we're both here for PhD. Oh. So he loves to like pretend it's about him. Like, it's not about him. He's so full of shit. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> I'm sure people could figure it out yeah. if they read it. Yeah, they'll throw you out. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you think Colin's identity changes or evolves throughout the book? It's divided mm-hmm. into into three parts. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us kind of what's happening to, to, to Colin throughout? Yeah, so like I envisioned the first chapter, the first section is kind of like is um, trying to navigate, like accept, like figuring out that you are in fact gay. Mm-hmm. or a call it and trying to like deal with like what that means and what that means to exist in like I grew up in you know rural Arkansas then Texas and now Oklahoma and so like to exist in these kinds of spaces as that and what implications that has mm-hmm. um there's a lot of fear and yeah. uncertainty and I it's often hard to negotiate that um in the real world but one thing that I really want to do with this book um there's lots of books about coming out stories that mm-hmm. are like coming out to others. Yeah. And I think that we don't talk enough about coming out to the self mm-hmm. because for me, like my coming out, my parents were wonderful. Um, I had no reason, like I didn't tell them till college, like it was in the middle of college, yeah. but still like they were so upset that like I had lied to myself oh. and that had made them, they're like, you hurt yourself. So you like, you needed to come out to yourself. And so I've always thought about like the fact that the outside of society can make you feel like you have to come out to yourself. Like you don't want to admit that you're a bad person to yourself or a bad person. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the beginning of the book really wants to grapple that, um, what it's like to come out to yourself and deal yeah. with that. You think that the opening, uh, the first one there, Sleepover, mm-hmm. you think that... Um, kind of underscores that, that oh, yeah. tension, that fear. Mm-hmm. Um, do you mind reading that one? Yeah, okay. of course, of course. So this is Sleepover. Rush to the part where we fear again, between footsteps and hall light switches. Force hush in our veins busy to reverse hands on thighs. Say the Pledge of Allegiance, least sexy words you know. Collateral damage, atrophy, terminal, any way to distract. Movies about ghosts, room after room of dark soup dust air. Tuck our boners back between legs. Make shadows on the walls into men with knives for eyes. Melon baller fingers that can scoop pulp faster than a jack-o'-lantern carving contest. And a father at the door with an axe ready to chop light across our bodies. Thank you. You know, and there's, I kind of see it in this form and maybe in in others, there's this tenderness and thoughtfulness with Mm -hmm. with Colin, but then that undercurrent of danger and Mm -hmm. the images like with the the axe and that kind of thing um, that all kind of come back to being gay in this world Mm -hmm. and in the South. What do you think your book says about coming of age um, in the South as a gay man? I think it's it's trying to remind, like, so for people to show people who are gay, like, when you're alone, like, mm-hmm. this is, this is not, you can survive this. Like, you can get, like, this is place is fine. Mm-hmm. You're not, it's not the end of the world. Like, you don't have to run away to New York. Right. You don't have to, um, it's going to be tough, but you can do it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for people who are not, like people trying to understand it, I've had so many people who have not, like, don't know gay people or who don't understand it, who like read it and tell me like, I was so heartbroken. They're like, you're able to laugh at it, but like, that's really messed up. Like, I didn't know that that happened. So I really want people to read it and like understand like, you, they don't think about these horrible things that happen or the things that people do to themselves, like the mental Olympics of, of like telling themselves they're less and telling themselves they're not worthy. And it's, you know, part of, of the society that they live in that when they see other people like you, it's like, oh, you're such a fag. Like mm-hmm. some people are less. Like, I mean, you do that all the time in the South. Yeah. Like it isn't a thing. And so I think... Yeah. I want people to realize, you know, hey, like, there are queer people around you mm-hmm. <laughs> and they're like struggling and they're trying not to hate themselves. And, you know, these are these struggles. Yeah. Like, it happens here too. Yes. It's still a thing. <laughs> so, what did you discover about yourself while working on this collection? Um, well, that's a deep question. I think a lot about like the fact that my coming out, you know, wasn't as it wasn't bad, mm-hmm. like to my parents and to my family. Yeah. But like looking back over it, you know, and realizing like people are like, wow, you were really hard on yourself, or like, wow, you were unnecessarily like, you know, dark, or mm-hmm. like you let some bad emotions happen to yourself. And I'm like, oh, I I just thought it was life. Like, yeah. I just thought it was existence. You know, I thought it was the water that I'm a fish living in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't think about, like, how messed up that was until it came out in the poems. Like, because it's not all me. Like, that's what I have to, yeah. I keep telling my grandmother. Like, <laughs> like Colin can stand it. There's a lot oh. of different people happening in this book. It's not me, all me. But some of it is. And some of the parts of it that are, like, really messed up it's like yeah that i did experience that wow that was messed up Mm -hmm. yeah or the found poem that you have mm -hmm. there um psychopathia yeah yeah that one oh that was tough i went back to the original and like read tried to match up uh, Mm -hmm. the case numbers with the real stuff and yeah that that's the way people were treated that that's another thing that i learned not about myself but like in the world like reading mm-hmm. that text like yes the way we classify and treat the people was really messed up because they were the first time that gay was used as like homosexual the term homosexual was invented then mm-hmm. in the ninth or in the 1880s you know yeah. so like this is relatively new new thing you can see that self-hate you know kind of throughout mm-hmm. that if you go back and read the the original yeah. how that kind of plays out and what people struggled with and yeah, and that guy, the guy, uh, I forget how to say his name, Ron Ebbing, or he's yeah. such an asshole. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just yeah, that the whole that whole. But so, what made you want to do uh, a found poem, and what was that like putting it together, and how did you decide mm-hmm. um, how you wanted it to look, like in terms of the form and all of that? So I actually read it in a in a my lit my literary theory class, Mm -hmm. I read across the text and I was like looking at it, I was like, this is messed up. (laughs) Like these case studies are so horrible. Um, And I just kept going back to and thinking about them. Mm -hmm. And then when I was playing with the project of Colin, I was like, oh my gosh, these are all, like these are numerical, this is a catalog of Collins, literally right here. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was like, okay, I want to play with this and like show the the diversity, like, because not, there's no one way to be a gay person in the world. And so, I think I got really into like playing with that idea. Like, you know, some of the characters cross dress. Some of the characters are like regular, like you would never know that they were gay and then that they just mm-hmm. happened to do that. And so I really wanted to take that text and make it something not like it's because it's messed up. Yeah. Um, but make it something reclaimed mm-hmm. and make it like showing, hey, this is, you know, these are people and they deserve some dignity. Yeah. And that's what I really just wanted to focus on. So I understand that you have a new poem that was recently published in a new territory mm-hmm. called Him to a Waterbed. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like you to read that for us and be, sure. tell us a little bit uh, about it. Okay. Uh, this is Him to a Waterbed. 
Our family found a new house across town. You pack the plates, husband. I know how to remove the guts of a thing. The body has to be held above its head to make it empty. The way a stag hangs face down for skinning. Dad hands me a hose, points to the spigot that says, attach and drain here before removal. The last thing anyone moves always ends up in the dumpster or attic, box of once a year things. Another trash bag full of what's left after new life meets demands of what was before. Like our hand-me-down appliances after the wedding. How it took ten minutes for the microwave to find a stranger's grateful hands. How many times can a person watch something bleed itself dry? Our mother places furniture in the new house, a leather and hardwood dream she never thought she would afford. Our brother buys time across the old cul-de-sac to the last truckload. Our father can't bear to see the world like this, waits downstairs for the water to pour. So this poem I wrote, so I actually helped um, my husband's family moved from their old house to their new house, mm -hmm. um, which is like, they, it was, it's a really nice house. They were really excited to get to, to move. Um, but when we were there, his, his stepmom pointed at me and said, oh, you're going to go help your dad. And so it just like, that was the first moment that it clicked where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I am part of y'all's family. And this was before we got married, mm -hmm. um, but she was already was like, it already brought me in as their family. It just felt like magical how that, and that just changing of the name, like instead of calling him Stan, instead of her Edie, you know, now it's mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And just the, the, the shift that happened. It was just like a thing that you don't think about every yeah. day. Um, just the, the switch in the names. And it was, I just felt immediately part of the family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was fun. So tell me how you met your husband. So we um, actually had met technically a long time ago. We were in the same fraternity, or he was in the sorority, and mm -hmm. I was in the fraternity. It's a non-gender um, based. It's the band fraternity and sorority, which is yeah, at UCA. Yes. Yeah. 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 And he was in the he was he did his undergrad at, at here at OSU, mm -hmm. and we were at the same conference though. And so, like, we had the same group of friends, and, like, there were pictures of us where we're in the same pictures. But this was, like, way before when I was an undergrad. Um, and we never talked. Like, we didn't know. He wasn't even out then. And so we were, you know, running in the same circles. And then I went and did my master's in Texas. He actually moved to Ohio for a while to work at Ohio University. Mm -hmm. And then we both ended up back, at Still <laughs> back in Stillwater um, working he was working here. He works, he still works here. And I started the PhD, mm -hmm. you know, how that on Facebook, it recommends friends. So it had noticed that we were living in the same place. Oh. Um, but we'd actually met on the dating website once I moved, like, okay, Cupid. I don't even know if okay, Cupid still exists. It might. <laughs> <laughs> and we we'd talked on there and like, it was just kind of weird to meet people online. So I was still kind of like, mm -hmm. and then it recommended us as friends because Facebook friends. I was like, oh, well, we actually do know each other. And Alibli texts me. He's like, oh, you were in Kappa Kappa Psi. And I was in talk. I was like, this is really weird. So then we decided to like go on a hangout. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we just started dating. And then it was just wonderful. So it was kind of weird and magical mm -hmm. um, in that sense. Yeah, just all those connections and how you're both in different yeah. places and the way you're brought Yeah, we were just together. like doing ice skating figure eight things across each other and then finally ran into each other. So how did you know he was the one? Oh gosh. Um, that's tough. I mean, there's so many little moments. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first date, and this is, sounds like I'm a drunkard, but I, we went to the bar uh -huh. and we went to Stonewall and we go to order and, and, and my drink is a normal standard drink. My father always said that a real man has a drink that is a mic one mixer and one liquor. And in Texas, it's really hot, San Marcos, um, and you don't want a lot of calories. So I'd get tequila tonic, pretty standard staple drink. So I ordered that, and the bartender, like, she's like, who are you trying to impress? 
I'm like, no one? Is this a normal drink? Okay. And then he orders a pitcher with no glasses. <laughs> and I'm like, you're going to say that not to him, but you say that to me. But of course, like, that, that impressed me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, it's really sweet. So it's just like that, like, that was like the first one. Like, okay, he's cute. Like, this is funny. Um, he's fun. I think, though, it's just like, the fact that we're ridiculous, like we're so ridiculous with each other mm-hmm. in a way that like I, we can see each other in ways that we would never let anyone else yeah. see like the stupid faces or like, you know, we talk about like make jokes about the dog mm-hmm. and um, we're just uh, allowed to be silly yeah. <laughs> with each other in a way that's very weird. Mm-hmm. Just kind of let yourself go. Yeah. So uh, tell me about getting married and what that whole experience was like? Where did you apply for your license and all of that? So we actually did it in Stillwater Mm -hmm. and we were scared out of our minds to go because of, you know, the Kim Davis and the marriage things. And um, we were genuinely super nervous Mm -hmm. to go because it's Stillwater, Oklahoma. And, you know, like, and looking back on it, it's like we should not have felt scared Mm -hmm. on the day of, like a day that that's that, was supposed to be special, but we were so nervous. Went to the metal detector, went up, and we were like timid at the counter. Like we need, because you have to both go in person, you know. Yeah. And so we we're getting the paperwork, um, and the people were just so nice. Like the lady was, I forget her name, I think it was Sherry. She was so nice though. Like mm-hmm. just went out of her way and was like asking about where's the wedding gonna be, mm-hmm. and so like we felt Im- immensely immediately better. Um, but the fact that we were scared just like still sits with me in a weird way but she was so cool like our, it had rained all week and we were having the wedding outside mm-hmm. on a saturday and she's like okay you need to go to this there's a sale on feet on pet shavings and straw go down here get this cover your backyard you'll be good it'll smell nice <laughs> and so she's just giving us all the advice on like how to make it because it was in our backyard and so um, yeah wonderful that she they were so nice Mm -hmm. Uh, but then the wedding was in our backyard and we just had we didn't want to do a big to do because like we didn't know like who pays for this (laughs) yeah (laughs) so we had just opted for his his parents um paid for a bar tab at stonewall because it was outside so they had like the people who work there they know us Mm -hmm. Um, they had put flowers out so it was really Mm -hmm. cute and we were on the the patio area and everyone had wristbands so like that to care the bar tab so it's very low key um, but we started in our backyard and had the ceremony there under a tree mm-hmm. um, and all, all of our parents were there which is magical mm-hmm. and, like, all of our friends um, and then we went and had the after party at, at the bar and it was mm-hmm. just lovely and we had cake and we made our own cake that was another thing we didn't buy a cake because we were too afraid to go try to buy a cake because oh yeah like what if they said no like Mm -hmm. and that's something that people don't think about like they're like oh why are you so mad you can't buy cake we're like well like i don't really want to go try to buy a wedding cake and like made to be feel like shit when i'm yeah supposed to be the happiest day of your life like those you know so-called mundane tasks that you know every person who's getting married has their list of things Mm -hmm. to do to just check off you think what's the big deal going to a bakery and Mm -hmm. asking for something but you just you don't know yeah and we just and we didn't want to deal with it (laughs) and there's not that many bakeries in Stillwater so we ended up making our own cake but we found the recipe and made it ourselves Mm -hmm. so we can instead of because who wants to eat frozen cake a year later we can make it, and it's our own recipe. So. Yeah, so what kind of cake? It is a cinnamon, it's like a fall spice cake, because it was in October, Aww. and it was all decorated with leaves. Mm-hmm. So it's a fall spice. It's like kind. Of, it's not pumpkin. It's like cinnamony, I don't know, ginger goodness. Yeah. yeah <laughs> with perfect. a cream cheese frosting. Yeah, perfect for the, for mm-hmm. the fall. Um, so there's a, a poem that you read for um, mm-hmm. the podcast, Dear Oklahoma, which is a collaboration between KOSC Radio, the OSU Library, and the Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa. Um, and I'm one of the co-hosts that I'd like you to share for this interview. Um, yeah, of course. Dear Oklahoma, add me to your ongoing list of people who never thought they'd end up here, 
with only the stuff I could cram into the back of my Toyota Yaris. Not part of the land run or trail of tears, just tricked into giving up everything for a Texas man who wanted to run away together, who ended up dumping me on I-35. Text message breakup at a truck stop just outside of Ardmore. Too late to turn back. I was certain you hated boys like me before I crossed the Red River when all the roommate wanted ad inquiries ended with the awkward. I'm not sure I'd be comfortable living with someone like you. Thought that's what you meant by Oklahoma standard till a blue-eyed man in plaid sent me a beer, winked across the bar, asked me to dance, eventually danced with me at our wedding, under a loblolly pine, with limbs that grew out despite relentless prairie wind. To your Oklahoma, add me to your ongoing list of people who found a reason to stay. So you found your reason to stay. Mm -hmm. What encouragement, and I'm sure I ask you this in the podcast, but I want to ask you this again, but what encouragement would you give to um, people who feel like they don't belong here mm -hmm. or they can't be here, maybe they're gay or trans mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is, what advice would you give or encouragement would you give? So I think first off, you have to think about why, like if you're thinking about leaving, think about the why. And if it's just because you, if it's just because, or if you love this place, but you feel like you have to go away because you're going to be better elsewhere, that's not a good reason. Um, but if you're actually like, oh, I want to go learn to do, you know, I don't know. If you want to be in ballet, you know, on in New York, that's fine. Like, that's a good reason. But if you're just leaving to leave, that's not mm -hmm. a good reason. Um, because I feel like a lot of small towns and, and places make people feel like they're not welcome there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so what if you're not? Yeah. If no one ever sees gay people or has to deal with them and they can just keep going on. And I think that like, if you love the place you're from then stay there, like mm -hmm. don't give up. Like we don't need that right now. Yeah. Be a positive force. Yeah. And I, and I love, I've, I've come to love Stillwater and I, I don't No, I have no reason to leave. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to make me feel lesser. Yeah. <laughs> like just literally a week ago, um, we were, I was saying goodbye to some friends. Like we went to the lake, Mm -hmm. And, you know, what you can park at the back of Walmart's parking lot mm -hmm. um, to avoid taking like a bajillion cars. So we parked there, went out, had a great time. Like they dropped us back off there. As we were getting out of the car, we hugged them goodbye. And some gentleman in a truck drove by and yelled out the window, hey, faggots. And it's just like, I'm like, this is 2018. Yeah. And it was just hugging someone goodbye. And like people often say, and I, it, bugs need to no end mm -hmm. the whole America's friendless friendliest college town like they'll plaster that everywhere but yeah. then they forget like I'm sorry these things still happen mm -hmm. in this town like don't act like it's super friendly like don't pretend that yeah we're... friendly for whom yeah friendly for who white yeah. straight people okay because <laughs> they've had issues on campus you know with like um the racial slurs and mm -hmm. and all these terrible things. I'm like, you can't have this right. <laughs> slogan plastered on everything when you're not doing anything. Yeah. I so, have to acknowledge it. Yeah. So I think like just staying here and existing, like I had a friend of mine told me they're like your existence is resistance. Mm -hmm. And just like the fact that queer people are here and people of color are here. Like mm -hmm. we exist and we're not going anywhere. I wanted to ask you um, about your writing process. Just kind of take me through um, that first impulse or sensation mm -hmm. that you have, or mood that you want to set for a poem, and how you get it started and revised and mm -hmm. in a form that you like. So the way I always, the way I feel about poems, or the way they come to me, it's everyone's different, of course. The way I, I like to use them, the metaphor of like a jellyfish, mm -hmm. <laughs> like floating above, and um, you know, imagine like you're really tiny and walking and there's a giant jellyfish above you and there's threads all around and every now and then you get hit by one. And so that's like, I feel like there'll be like an image that'll hit me or like I'll hear a lyric to a song or I'll see um, something that'll just give me one line. 
and I'll grab that one line, like that piece of the jellyfish string, mm -hmm. and I got it. I got that one line, but I can't find, I got to find the rest of the jellyfish. Yeah. But it's so big, like, there's so many ways to go, but it's like having that one line. It's like having that one line on the page, and then, like, sometimes I'll have lines that just sit, and I have a giant Google Doc with mm -hmm. just lines, and I'll have to let them sit for a while. Yeah. And I'll come back, and I'll be like, have an idea in my head going, and then I'm like, okay, this one line needs this, this, this. Um, so and it's normally like an image, mm -hmm. or it's either an image or just a phrasing that I like. And then it'll come back to me. So I, I save the one little strands, mm -hmm. um, and then pull them out when it's time to, to write. Sometimes, though, you pull the strand, and then it's like, okay, I know where this is going, and I yeah. write the whole thing. It just um, kind of differs from piece to piece. Yeah. What makes a poem successful or enduring or a classic? I always think of the, I mean, ethos, pathos, logos and mm -hmm. is a good way to think about it. But I think when you think about poetry, it's not a triangle. It's more like a, what would this be, a pyramid? Mm -hmm. Like a four-dimensional or three-dimensional pyramid. So um, there's kairos is involved. Mm -hmm. So you have to like be ethically sound. You have to, you know, emotionally be in tune. The speaker has to be somewhat trustworthy, yeah. but it also has to have that element of being of the time of the moment mm -hmm. um, that's simultaneously of the moment and timeless, which is hard to pull off. Mm -hmm. um, but just capturing the three within that or the four things within the poem. So like Frank O'Hara's having a Coke with you mm -hmm. is for me such a good example of that. Like Coca-Cola is one of those endearing images like we're never going to. I mean, maybe like a billion years in the future, people won't have Coca-Cola, <laughs> yeah. but we'll still understand at the root of that poem, it's still about love. It's mm -hmm. still about um, just the mundane, doing nothing with the person you love is better than, you know, mm -hmm. everything else. And that emotion and in that, in that time and moment, um, it's just so, it's, it's perfect. It's a perfect love poem. I think like finding those, the, the four things, mm -hmm. the center between all of them is what makes it happen. How do you think your work has changed over time? Or what do you think your body of work so far um, represents? I think it's gotten a lot more um, bolder, mm -hmm. <laughs> less, because um, like the poems I wrote at my MFA were not fully out of, even out of the closet yet. Um, so I feel like this book, there are some pieces from my MFA thesis in it, um, not that many. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's gotten just more unabashed yeah. <laughs> and just like, you know, here's, here's me, whatever, do this. Like I, I, I say, I don't know how many times I talk about boners in the book um, <laughs> or just weird things. Like I, I've just mm -hmm. realized like I'm getting no fucks to give. Right. It's <laughs> the best way I can think to say yeah. that at the moment um, as I go on. And it's kind of like part of the time too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. Just like sometimes yeah. I, no more walls, no more filters. Yeah, that's just it's a good way to sum it <laughs> up. <laughs> um, what's your best writing advice to aspiring poets, established poets, mm -hmm. frustrated poets? And the oldest adage is read, like yeah. read all the time. Mm -hmm. But I also think that people don't want to talk about it or admit to their passive consumption of media. Mm -hmm. So like the binge watching Netflix, uh -huh. like people, poets don't, no one wants to admit they do that when they're like trying to be scholarly and writerly. Um, I think though, putting a lens on your passive consumption and thinking about how does this relate mm -hmm. to what I'm trying to write or what I'm wanting to do project wise. Mm -hmm. So my current project I'm working on is, the, is called tentatively titled The House Down. And it's mm -hmm. dealing with like putting up and taking down like the idea of a house, mm -hmm. um, both as like a you know, relationship or family or, you know, in the political sense or all these different senses. So like I, my passive consumption a lot is HDTV. So I'm learning like oh, things in the yeah. background. Like it's, I'm learning language mm -hmm. to use in my writing. So I'm not, it's just meant to be entertaining, but then it's like, oh, I know what shiplap is now. Oh, I know what, okay, <laughs> like how to watch. talk. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah. yeah. So it's like using, making sure that your passive consumption isn't just passive. Like you can mm -hmm. find things that you enjoy there's your background garbage mm -hmm. that can actually be helpful in your writing life yeah or even like yeah, podcasts too mm -hmm. like podcasts or um things like that like find making sure your passive consumption is doing something mm -hmm. and other than just like you know sitting there watching it yeah 
So what do you think the biggest misconception is about Oklahoma when it comes to being a place to write poetry or to create art? I often feel like people, people always tell me like, why do you live there? Like, what's, isn't that just like a desert with like, where they made all the Native Americans go live? I was like, no, it's not. I mean, partially. Yeah. But it's, it's a, it's a beautiful landscape. Mm-hmm. And I think people don't think about that or want to acknowledge that mm-hmm. outside of Oklahoma or like people are like, oh, tornadoes are so scary. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions about like what actually is Oklahoma Yeah. <laughs> in the writing world. They, I feel like they don't care to know enough. And so they just rely on the assumptions that it's rural and poor and full of like tornadoes and earthquakes, mm-hmm. quick natos. Um, and I wish that people wouldn't. And maybe, this, maybe yeah. all, all this work will change that. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? I feel like I've talked a lot already. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're good. Ask you all the I questions. didn't know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm There's, there's I'm no good. cap. Um, okay. <laughs> but I'd like to end um, our interview with a reading of your poem on Dancing with Southern Boys. Mm-hmm. Before you read it, um, could you tell me a little bit about why you chose this one, like why you want this one to be your So that like, it stems from um, people. So when I went on book tour land with with Colin, a lot of people were shocked. Like, are we? Are you gonna move? Like, you're gonna finish the PhD and like move somewhere, right? Yeah. You're gonna like get a job somewhere else that isn't here. And I'm like, no, I plan on staying in yeah. in Stillwater for a minute. I just got a job at the Honors College, so. Yeah. I like it and I don't they're like well why would you want to live there and like isn't it terrible and and so part of that informed this idea of like trying to explain loving a place or loving people that supposedly aren't supposed to love you mm-hmm. back um and so this comes out of that and also mm-hmm. like thinking about the passive consumption we were just talking about mm-hmm. one of my favorite shows to passively absorb because it has like some of the best one-liners for when you're trying to do southern dialogue mm-hmm. uh true blood oh yeah <laughs> the, sh- the show true blood mm-hmm. um i was channeling a jason stack house and um, he's so dumb but he's really cute so huh. if you could get it like it reminds me a lot of gentlemen that i found attractive over the years So this is on Dancing with Southern Boys. I love them most when they speak, not. The bullshit about shoveling cow shit all day. But the way they make words linger just long enough to live in. Like my youth, when boy lasted two minutes till they came. Sweetheart was something reserved for private. Their girlfriends and me. The way a man at the roundup can bring me to prayer with the word baby. I know that this is just some patriarchy shit, or a holdover endearment from their mama. I've called this place home enough to know the full etymology, taken enough faggots, half full soda cans out truck windows, and still burning cigarettes to my flesh to really know. Just let me have a moment where I am queen of prom or homecoming, or harvest festival, or whatever fruit, vegetable, animal, mineral, plus celebration fits his hometown of 2052 on a good day, in sunlight, when he calls me his. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.